This is the Monday, March 7th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, we're stepping through the Guardian of Forever and back to the early 1700s, when temperatures ran high in politics, the press, and from a smallpox epidemic burning through Boston. This is a time before there was an America, when Massachusetts was still a colony. Leading us on this journey is Stephen Koss, who describes himself as an author, ad guy, and, quote, close personal friend of Ben Franklin. Stephen's debut book is The Fever of 1721, the epidemic that revolutionized medicine and American politics. In his book, we meet the young Franklin laboring at his brother James's newspaper at a time when colonial authorities had their boot on the throat of free speech, and as a political war rages over the controversial topic of inoculation against the dreaded pox. You can follow today's guest at cos one cos on Twitter, that's the digit one, and cos spelt C-O-S-S, cos one cos And you can visit his website, stephencoss.com. And note that he's a Stephen with a P-H, not with a V. Stephen takes us back to October of 1721, when about half of Boston's population fell ill with smallpox, and about 800 died from the disease. In a city of 1 million by comparison, that translates to 600,000 people falling sick and 90,000 dead. Imagine how many people that is. 90,000 dead. It's almost enough to fill the big house in Michigan. In October of 1721, 13 people were dying every single day. This is the story of the many fevers of the human mind and body, in a story that reads like a modern thriller about a deadly virus but was a fact of life that was all too real for the people of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who could expect to suffer a smallpox epidemic, almost like clockwork, every 12 years. Join us now as we meet Stephen Koss and learn about the fever of 1721. I'm joined on the line by Stephen Koss, author of The Fever of 1721, the epidemic that revolutionized medicine and American politics. Thank you for making the time to talk with the History Author Show today. You're welcome, Dean. The Fever of 1721, it's your first book, and it paints a picture that's almost like the first day of spring as I was reading it, because there's a lot going on. It's an exciting time, and it's very early in so many things. You kind of see all of these sprouts in medicine, religion, politics, journalism, science. So as a first-time author, how did this broad picture come into focus? Very gradually. I actually first came upon the idea way back in 1993 believe it or not. That Christmas, my wife and my sons gave me, as a stocking stuffer, one of those little desk calendars, fact-a-day calendar. And I was thumbing through it. And in the course of doing that, I came across September 8th. And that date mentioned the fact that in 1721, there was a smallpox epidemic in Boston. And it also went on to say that Cotton Mather, the minister, convinced a doctor named Zabdiel Boylston to begin an inoculation, an inoculation experiment. I had never really heard about Boylston. I knew it as a street in Boston, and I knew Cotton Mather as the bad guy from Salem. But I was really intrigued. So I started doing a little research. At the time, I was working in advertising. I was writing and producing mostly TV commercials. And like a lot of ad guys, I had the idea that I might want to write a screenplay. And I thought, wow, this is a pretty dramatic situation. So I jumped in. I did enough research so that I understood enough to write a 100-page screenplay. I wrote that. That pretty much concentrated on the inoculation experiment and on the controversy that it caused. 
But in the course of doing all that research, I realized there was actually more to the year than just the inoculation experiment that really had, and there was a whole political drama that was playing out, that it was the launch of the first independent newspaper in America, that it was an incredibly important and formative year for Benjamin Franklin, who was a printer's apprentice in Boston at the time. I knew these things, but the screenplay wouldn't really accommodate them. So what I did was I stuck, I wrote the screenplay based on the inoculation controversy and then did what a lot of people do with screenplays. I put it in a drawer and it sat in a drawer for about 10 years or actually over a decade. And then kind of fast forward to 2007 and I'm having a beer one night with a friend of mine named James Campbell, who's an author, a great history author. And he and I were talking about books and screenplays and ideas. And I mentioned the screenplay to him and sort of mentioned some of the extensions of it in terms of the larger story of 1721 beyond smallpox, beyond inoculation. And he said sort of out of the blue, you should write this as a book. And uh, I was a little intimidated by that idea because I had written a book before and because I didn't have sort of the traditional historian credentials. But I was so enamored of the idea that I thought, well, let me, let me give it a try. And to make sort of a long story short, I jumped back into the research and realized that, in fact, there was a lot more there than I realized. For example, Elisha Cook, who appears in my book as sort of the leader of the Massachusetts Rebellion against the Crown, I think of him as kind of a founding grandfather. He actually had a personal connection to Sam Adams, who we call the firebrand of the American Revolution. Sam Adams' father, also named Sam Adams Sr., also called the deacon, worked for Cook and actually was his lieutenant, his political lieutenant in the uh, 1730s. And so therefore, I realized that there was actually a direct connection from Elisha Cook, who in my book I talk about starting the Boston Caucus and starting the popular party that became the Patriot Party. I talk about Elisha Cook as having a direct uh, connection to Sam Adams, because indeed, Elisha Cook would come to the Adams house, he would uh, talk politics with Sam Adams Sr., and Sam Adams Jr. would sit at their feet and listen. And so there's a direct and personal tie from 1720, well, from a character from 1721, Cook, to a man who helped uh, actually launch the American Revolution. So that was, you know, that was a kind of thing I'd find as I got deeper and deeper into it. That's the book I ended up writing. And I imagine that most historians have a similar story in terms of peeling back the layers of the onion and seeing what is there. In my case, it was partly luck. As I said, I started knowing very, very little. But I think it was kind of lucky that I didn't know too much because I think a lot of people who study some of the things I'm talking about in this book tend to be very siloed in terms of they taught, they study Benjamin Franklin or they study medical history or they study American political history. I just came into it sort of open minded and started learning and kind of cross referencing all these things. And I think in the end, that's kind of what made the book different. I felt as if reading it was not only a journey back in time, but you look in the mirror, or you look at yourself and you see so many things differently. For instance, inoculation is an easy thing to take for granted now. Of course, there's controversy with some people who I guess kind of wish they lived back in Cotton Mather's day yeah. before him that they didn't have them. But I was reading another book, David Petrusha's 1932, The Rise of Hitler and FDR, and I read something in there that I'd never even thought about and certainly didn't know, that FDR thought that he contracted the polio virus right in a place where I used to camp as a Boy Scout, the Boy Scout camp that is in Alpine, New Jersey. They said uh, right in there, and that's where he thinks that he contracted it, and I said there's so many things, be it smallpox, be it polio, any of the other things that we are vaccinated for, that we never think that that's a moment that our life might have hinged on. But it's not always a dramatic thing like uh, what if you could go back in time and save Abraham Lincoln or it's, it could be something small like getting a disease. And certainly in those days, smallpox was not something small. You quote a line from 1859 describing smallpox as the most terrible of all ways to die. 
Yeah, filling the graveyards, leaving the faces of those who survived horribly scarred. You never forgot that you had smallpox in a way that today we certainly forget if we were vaccinated for it or vaccinated for polio. You just get vaccinated when you're a kid. You never think about it again. But those antibodies stay inside you and are just vigilant there, silently waiting to protect you. And so I wanted you to just briefly explain why the old insult, a pox on your house, why that's particularly nasty. Because since reading The Fever of 1721, I decided, gosh, I'd never say that to anybody again after reading this book. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely not something you'd wish on anybody, even an enemy. Yeah, I think the thing is that because it's been, it's gone now, it has been eradicated, in part because of the role that Boylston played in, in moving us, moving science in that direction. Because it's gone, except for you know a few uh, specimens that that live on in labs, um, it's easy to forget how terrible it was. And you know, as you mentioned, it was a lot of people thought of it as the very worst thing out there. There's an estimate that by the early 1700s, it had killed one tenth of all mankind. That's everybody. Wow. Yeah, and it was definitely in America the most feared and dreaded disease of the 18th century. John Adams called it the king of all terrors. 19th century medical textbook called it the most loathsome and fatal disease known to man. And of course, as your listeners surely know, it darn near wiped out the Native American population in New England. I'll tell you a little bit about it to give you an idea of why it was so terrible, because we don't experience it, thank God, these days. Part of the reason it spread so quickly was that it had a relatively long incubation period. So it took about 12 days from when you first were, first contracted it to when you started to manifest the symptoms. So a lot of people had smallpox and they'd walk around and after a while they got to a point where they were contagious and they were spreading it. They didn't realize they were sick. Nobody else realized they were sick. And that was a recipe for an epidemic. When it did come, it started very innocuously. It started like a bad cold or, or a not so bad flu. There was a general malaise. People reported saying, you know, it was just like your body didn't work quite right. And then shortly thereafter, you'd start to get a headache and a stomach ache and a backache. And then you'd start to develop a fever and, the, and your temperature would rise and you'd vomit and you'd get the chills. But at this point, there was still nothing, none of the skin eruption that we usually think of when we think of smallpox. So it seemed like it, it could be anything. And then to make it even more complicated or more hard to nail down, all of that went away after about two days. So the person actually started to think that he or she was recovering and that it wasn't a big deal and they were going to get better. And just when they thought that was the case, they'd start to get a sore throat and they'd start to develop a light red rash, usually on their face. And then not long after that, sores would, that rash would start to become sores on your throat and in your mouth and in your nasal passages the fever would return, the rash would get redder, you know, these hundreds and hundreds of these raised fluid-filled vesicules would start to rise on your skin. Your throat would close because of them, so you couldn't swallow. Uh, your eyes would be swollen shut. You'd get a delirious fever. You'd have excruciating pain. And this would go on for like a week. And then in the second week, the sores would start to turn to, more, turn putrid to become pustules. And at this point, People who had really bad smallpox would sometimes, one of the biggest concerns was that when you turn somebody over in the bed, their skin would actually peel off because, <laughs> that, yeah, because that's how uh, sick it was. That's how diseased it was. So, you know, it was a terrible, terrible disease to have. Now, as far as mortality goes, it varied by population. It varied by the circumstances and by the kind of smallpox you ended up getting. Generally, anywhere from 15 to maybe 50 percent of patients with with what they call distinct smallpox, which were raised smallpox, but they were all separate from each other. 15 to 50% of them died. If you had confluent smallpox, where the, all, the, all the pustules and vesicles bunched together, it killed up to 60% of people. And if you had hemorrhagic smallpox, where the smallpox actually turned into the body, turned inward versus outward, and it would cause bleeding, and they would be dark purple, they were easy to distinguish, that was fatal in almost every every victim. So that was bad news. But if you survived, it was still bad news generally because many, many people who had smallpox, as I mentioned, it, you know, it would be in your eyes. Many people who had smallpox were left blind. In fact, there's an estimate that nearly one-third of all the cases of blindness that had occurred up to the end of smallpox 
were caused by smallpox. Sometimes there was permanent brain damage uh, from encephalitis. Uh, there could be severe arthritis. And the most famous consequence was facial disfiguring. Sometimes it, was, it just left a few scars, uh, like with George Washington, for example. But some people were completely disfigured and horribly disfigured. And um, it was a big deal back then. Even though smallpox was so common, people who were left with the scarring were kind of ostracized. So it, getting back to your question about sort of, you know, why this was so bad and why you know, a pox on your house or something like that was such a horrible thing to say, what happened was, you know, this thing I just described would infect one person in a family, and then generally speaking, it would infect everybody in a family. And so if you're saying, if you're wishing a pox on somebody's house, what you're basically wishing is that you and your children suffer a long and excruciating illness, and that you know, you're left dead or maimed or disfigured. So it was truly a terrible thing. It's only a part of your book, although it does kick off from there. So I don't want people to think that the entire book is pustules. The fever does <laughs> refer to a lot of other things. For instance, the first political machine puts down its roots. We see that's one of these sprouts that I mentioned seeing as I was reading the book. Tammany Hall and all those machines, that starts here during the fever of 1721. There's a new royal governor. This is also one of the subplots in your book. Samuel Shute, the Massachusetts Assembly, is against him when he comes. So here we see sort of the sprout of the American Revolution coming here. Who's this guy all the way from Britain coming and imposing the crown on us when this is our job and this is our family and our place to run? How does that conflict between those two forces play out as the disease creeps into Boston? Yeah, by the time smallpox arrived in Boston in, in the spring of 1721, Governor Samuel Shute and uh, the House of Representatives were really at each other's throats. I mean, it was sort of a, it was a state of cold war. It was a very dysfunctional situation. Shute had come to Massachusetts as a royal governor late in about 1716. He had a lot of challenges when he arrived. Relations between England and Massachusetts had always been troubled. I mean, uh, Massachusetts was the thorn in England's side right from the start. But in this case, they had worsened somewhat. And then there was a severe currency crisis also going on in Massachusetts. All of the metal currency w was gone, or, or most of it was gone. And there was a huge fight over paper currency, whether, you know, who, whether, whether it should be printed at all, who should print it? Should it be a private bank? Should it be a public bank? Or should the people just tough it out? The previous governor, Joseph Dudley, had been hostile to the whole idea of paper currency. And the men who would become, who had formed this a political machine in Massachusetts, Elisha Cook being the leader of that, were for paper currency. So they were really curious to know what Shute was going to do when he got to Massachusetts. And people were pretty optimistic because it had been 14 years since Dudley arrived. So it was the first new governor in 14 years. Um, Shute was also a Puritan, an English Puritan. And, you know, Massachusetts had had some pretty horrible, it was, uh, Boston was a Puritan town even at this point. And the town had had some pretty terrible experiences with other governors who were Anglicans and who had very little sympathy for the Puritans. And although Shute had become a, an Anglican, because that's kind of, that was a politically expedient thing to do, he was still, they thought, somebody who understood what they were all about. So he came into town and they thought, okay, well, this guy, maybe this is going to work. Maybe this guy's going to do it. Unfortunately, early on, there was also a concern because it, it became known that uh, the previous governor, Dudley, had arranged for Shute's appointment. So then all of a sudden now people like Elisha Cook thought, well, this is not a good situation. Cook's situation was that he was the son of another man named Elisha Cook, who had been um, one of the most staunch supporters of the original Massachusetts Charter, which gave Massachusetts a lot of liberty, and one of the biggest opponents of what was called the New Charter, which took away some things like the colony's right to choose its own governor and also gave England the right to approve or disapprove of Massachusetts laws. Uh, Elisha Cook Sr. Was, a, was an opponent of, the, of those. And when Elisha Cook Jr. came to the forefront uh, a few years before uh, Shute arrived, he kind of took up that battle for his father. So when Shute arrived, you know, they had the first problem was the currency problem. And, and, and Shute made like he was going to support the idea of paper currency and then at the last minute changed his mind. And then he started 
insisting on some royal prerogatives in terms of, well, things that England had told him he ought to get, like, for example, a fixed salary. One of the only points of leverage that the Massachusetts people had over the royal governor, who they did not get to choose, was deciding on the amount of and the timing of his salary. So, you know, they had a little bit of control over this guy because they can, if he wasn't doing, if he wasn't playing ball with them, they could basically say, we're cutting back your salary or we're not going to pay you at all until next year. And this, this, as England knew, was a, a real problem in terms of wrestling with, um, the, you know, the rebellion or the rebelliousness of Massachusetts. They had to, they had to get a governor who had a fixed salary, which would take the power out of the hands of the people of Massachusetts. So Chute came on. He wanted a fixed salary. He also wanted pre-publication publication censorship of the colony's printing presses, uh, in part because the House of Representatives uh, printed some very negative things about him, and he wanted to stop them from doing that. He wanted the. He also wanted the right to be able to negative or veto the Speaker of the House. Um, he had complete control over what was the upper house of the legislature, known as the Governor's Council. But the House of Representatives was really the people's chamber, and they got to pick who went there, they got to vote who went there, and they got to choose who they wanted to lead them. But he tried to insist that he wanted a, uh, a speaker who he agreed with. Cook basically started making Shute's life miserable when it turns out they couldn't work together. And that caused a lot of problems for Shute back in England because a lot of people were looking to see if he was going to be able to bring Massachusetts under control. What ended up happening is that by the time smallpox began to spread, she was really kind of desperate. He really needed to bring these guys under control. And so he decided basically that he would leverage the threat of smallpox in order to, you know, finally gain, gain control over these guys. So what he, uh, what he ended up doing, he knew that the, the members of the general court, which was the name of the legislature, the House of Representatives and the council, he knew that they were very nervous about smallpox. They wanted to, as soon as they came for the first session after the epidemic began, they said, well, we'd like to be relocated to Cambridge because there is no smallpox there and it'll be safer. And what Shute did was say, was basically hold them back and say, I'll move you after you make certain concessions to me. And so, and these weren't the major concessions. These were smaller concessions and the House made them, but did not admit they made them, as is often the case in politics. And so this continued to happen for the next several sessions as the smallpox epidemic got worse and worse. October was the deadliest month of the, of the smallpox epidemic. In late October, Shute called another session of the legislature. Now, he knew no one would come to Boston, so he automatically sent it to Cambridge. But unfortunately, by this point, smallpox was spreading to Cambridge as well. Members of the House of Representatives, who were known as deputies, arrived in Cambridge and Shute assured them that they were going to have a very, very brief session, just take care of the most pressing business at hand, and then he would let them go. In fact, what happened was he started hitting them again with these requests or these demands, I should say, and about a fixed salary and about it, sort of other things that had come up that he that equated to admitting that he was in charge and they weren't in charge. And despite the threat of smallpox, they refused. So he kept them. There was a standoff. He kept them in Cambridge despite the threat of smallpox. And they, despite the spread of smallpox, refused to capitulate. And what ended up happening is uh, smallpox did finally strike the House of Representatives and, Representatives and it killed one of the most popular members of the, of the assembly. And that turned out to be really sort of the last straw in terms of Massachusetts's relationship with Shute. He hung around for another 12 months, and he ended up actually leaving. He was basically forced out. But for that 12 months, he received absolutely no cooperation whatsoever from the House of Representatives. So he was really a lame duck. So basically, he tried to use this crisis, this public health emergency, to a political end, and it ended up backfiring. My guest is author Stephen Koss, and the book you're hearing about is The Fever of 1721, the epidemic that revolutionized medicine and American politics. You can follow today's guest at Koss1Koss on Twitter or visit his website, stephenkoss.com. Again, that's Stephen with a PH and Koss with a C. Library Journal gave The Fever of 1721 a starred review, and they wrote, quote, 
Casa's gem of a colonial history immerses readers into 18th century Boston and introduces a collection of fascinating people and intriguing circumstances. The author's masterly work intertwines Boston's smallpox epidemic with the development of the New England current publisher James Franklin's radical press. So I wanted to touch on James Franklin and, of course, his more famous younger brother. I had mentioned to you when we were preparing to do this that Matt Douglas had left a very nice review view for the History Author Show on iTunes. He does the Nightmare 365 podcast that you might want to check out if you like all things Halloween-y and horror and such. But he asked if we would do something on Ben Franklin. And I said, well, we have something coming right here on Ben Franklin. So I tweeted him back there and tweeted you and kind of put him in touch with your book. Ben Franklin shows up as a young apprentice at this point. Ben Franklin is still so fascinating precisely because he was so long-lived. I mean, he was almost like a Highlander or a time traveler. You don't expect to go all the way back to 1721 and even find him alive, much less it taken kind of his first job here. There's the widow Silence Duguid, whose sort of mysterious letters start appearing there at James Franklin's newspaper and begin to publish them. So give us a little taste of that and how this whole idea of a free press is taking root. This is another one of these shoots that's poking up because the papers are downplaying the outbreak of smallpox. There's all this going on that you were just talking about, this strife with the royal governor. So who was Silence Duguid and what was her story about the young Ben? Ben Franklin, or what does it tell us about the young Ben Franklin? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think it tells us quite a bit. And, you know, understandably, because, as you say, Ben Franklin led such an, a long and eventful life, biographies of him, even the best biographies, tend not to spend a lot of time on this part of his life. And it's understandable. There's so much else to cover. But, you know, I say half kiddingly that everything Ben Franklin ever really needed to know, he learned in 1721. And I'm kind of kidding, but I'm kind of not kidding. And really, as you mentioned, this marked actually 1722, the beginning of the following year, when he started publishing secretly in his brother's newspaper, the New England Current, as Silence Do Good. The backstory of that is James Franklin started the, the New England Current actually to oppose inoculation, at least nominally. What happened was James Franklin, Ben's older brother, came back from his printer's apprenticeship in England. He desperately wanted to start a newspaper. There were two others in Boston. Everybody said Boston doesn't even need two, never mind three. But he just wanted to start one. He was looking for some angle, some way in. And so I maintain in the book that he really he was very opportunistic. So when smallpox came along, when Boylston started conducting these experiments, they were very controversial. James Franklin, with the help of a few other people who had their own access to grind, uh, decided to start a newspaper because he knew everybody wanted to know about this. James wanted to do a lot more than talk about inoculation. He wanted to create a really literary, political, interesting newspaper, the likes of which had never been seen. And he did. He, he created this paper. And his brother, Benjamin, was obviously his apprentice and helped print the paper. And Benjamin, as he worked, he would sit around the printing house and he'd listen to James and his friends um, talk about politics and, and social issues and literature. And they were they were the contributors to the New England Current. They called them the Courantiers. And Benjamin desperately wanted to be part of the group. And he had been conducting his own self-education, his fabled self-education for several years since he'd come aboard in 1718. He'd been reading a lot. He'd been practicing his writing. It was sort of the education that he didn't get at Harvard. He, you know, his father had pulled him out of school. So Benjamin was just waiting for the opportune moment to jump in. Now, you know, be part of the part of the group, one of the courantiers. Now he knew that James, his older brother, would have no part of it because, for one thing, as an apprentice, it just would have not been the thing to do. Apprentices were supposed to be lowly subservient. They were supposed to do the dirty work. They weren't supposed to be smart, witty. And Benjamin Franklin and James had a very troubled relationship. They were both really talented, very bright men. But James must have seen that Ben was a genius. He must have felt, he felt envious of him right from the start and was worried about him. So anyway, Ben knew he couldn't appear as Ben Franklin in this publication, but he was desperate to appear. So he created Silence Do Good, which was about the farthest thing from a young boy apprentice 
as he could think of. Silence Do Good presented herself as a widow from the country who had been married to a minister. And the reason he picked Silence, as I say, was because he wanted somebody very different from himself, an alter ego that was as completely different as possible. But it's interesting because when everybody looked at Silence Do Good in retrospect, when they finally revealed who she really was, it kind of makes sense because Actually, there were some similarities between Ben and Silence that nobody could pick up at the time, but that were, were clear after the fact. For example, a woman was expected to be seen and not heard. So was an apprentice. They were relatively powerless. They had very few legal rights. Silence, as she told her own story, had very little formal education, but had been educated or educated herself thanks to the library of her deceased husband. Ben Franklin had been pulled out of school by his father at a young age. He had conducted his own um, education and had conducted a lot of that education with the books contained in his brother's printing house library and also in the library of uh, one of his brother's friends, uh, who, who very generously let him borrow books. So they had that in common as well. Also, there was another kind of clue. You know, a few years earlier, while Ben was trying to improve himself and his powers of expression and his powers of writing and arguing, he and one of his friends, a guy named John Collins, had debated whether girls and young women should be formally educated. And Ben, in, in, you know, he later said a little for dispute's sake, so he kind of, <laughs> he kind of couched it, he kind of qualified his approval of that. But Ben took the side of women and said, yes, in fact, women should be educated. So you take all those clues after the fact and you go, oh, yeah, it kind of makes sense that Ben Franklin, on the one hand, didn't want his brother to know who he was. On the other hand, had to create a character who he could relate with, and that was Silence Duguid. Silence Duguid would, would end up writing 14 letters to the current to, over the course of about seven months, they cover a wide range of subjects and they take on a wide range of tones and really they kind of encapsulate what Ben Franklin would write about for the rest of his life. The letters were funny, they were charming, they were saucy, but they were also very powerful in some cases and edgy and sly. Silence was sort of an early version of everything, all the traits we think of when we think of Franklin. And she also tells us, in terms of what she tells us about Franklin, I mean, she tells us that right from the age of 16 and 17, Franklin had strong feelings about politics, strong feelings about social issues, strong desire for fame, and a real knack for saying controversial, edgy, potentially offensive things in a disarming kind of way that let him get away with it. You know, a lot of the guy we see many years later being our most powerful and effective diplomat can be, traces of that can be seen this early in some of the sounds do good things. So that's who Silence was. And Ben loved playing Silence. He, what he loved best was that his brother's friends, whom he called ingenious, he, he really admired them, all thought that they were great. And they used to sit around and speculate about who was actually writing them. And they knew it was a man, or they figured it was a man. But all the names they mentioned were very accomplished, educated, erudite men, when in fact it was a 17-year-old kid. Yeah, and that way that you described him there as an apprentice, seen and not heard, doing kind of the grunge work, not really going to be given any sort of voice, certainly not going to compete on the byline there of the paper or compete with the boss. These things all apply to a little brother. So I think anybody who is a little brother as I am or has one who is an older brother, can you imagine then suddenly when he reveals this, everyone's coming in. I, I pictured it very much reading The Fever of 1721, them coming in and smacking him on the back and saying, wow, kid, what a great job. And, you know, James sort of sitting there boiling a little bit because not that he didn't love his brother, not that he didn't think that his writing was good, but he made him look like a fool. Well, he did. And, and, and that, and that, that's a hard thing to swallow from anybody, of course. And yeah. Ben Franklin does this. And not only that, he has the presence of mind to quit while he's on the top. He takes those sort of two weeks there and he doesn't write anything or however long it is. And people are wondering, where is silence? Where is silence? And then he pens that fair well. And the fact that he has this presence of mind that we see with great performers to this day, people want more Sopranos or they want more episodes of Seinfeld. And the creators will say, well, I thought we said what we needed to say. 
Faulty Towers, for instance, 12 episodes. You remember all of them. Right, and right. John, John Cleese says, people ask me to do more, but in your mind with comedy, you edit out the bad parts. There were jokes in Faulty Towers that didn't work, he says, of course, but you don't remember those. You remember the good ones. So it's hard to go back to it. It's hard to keep it at the top of your game. So not only is he impressing with his ability, he's impressing with his professionalism and his dedication to the writing craft. So Benjamin Franklin is an amazing character in the book because while he's doing all of that, while he's fighting for this idea of a free press that eventually will be accepted and we accept today as a foundational part of individual liberty and democracy, he's only a young kid and he's not really being affected by the smallpox, yet it's starting to swirl around him. And he keeps working at this. His brother, of course, this is a time when the government controls the press. His brother is getting thrown in jail, gets held in jail. And this is another part of your book that we deal with. There really are these multiple fevers raging. So I want to mention for your sake, it's a clever title for the book because there's a lot going on. And the inoculation, again, you started to talk about Cotton Mather a little bit. Of course, we know him from the Crucible and from the, his role in the Salem Witch Trials. He remains, as you write in The Fever of 1721, 400 years later, just as much a challenge as when he was alive to decide. He comes at this in an amazing way. He's been disgraced here by the Salem Witch Trials, and yet he's unrepentant. He's the one person who really hasn't been made to pay a price for that, except in his reputation. And he seems such an unlikely hero for a cause as enlightened as inoculation. So I wondered, as you're researching the book, how did that feel? Were you hoping you'd be able to find him as a, a black or white, as a victim or as a hero in the book? and Or did you just find him fascinating because he does embrace this cause of inoculation? Yeah, that's a great question. I had the opinion or the attitude about Cotton Mather that I think most people have, which is he was a villain or the villain, in some people's imaginations, of the Salem witch trials. So when I saw that, as I mentioned, I you know first came upon the idea in a little fact-a-day calendar page, when I saw that he was the one who told Zabdiel Boylston about inoculation, it seemed almost inconceivable. You know, it's almost as if, you know, think of a villain, you know, this villain all of a sudden becomes a hero. How did this happen? So that was certainly was one of the things that drew me into the story. And I definitely wanted in the course of the book to understand him, which is a, a very tough thing to do. Not an easy guy to understand. But I thought that it was important to kind of move beyond the black and white. Is Was he good or was he bad? In fact, he was kind of a little bit of both. You know, he was really one of the most brilliant people in colonial America. Right from the time he was a child, he was a prodigy. He would memorize huge chunks of biblical scripture. He was the youngest, for a long time, the youngest graduate from Harvard College. He owned the biggest personal library in America. You know, I started discovering all these things about him. Even before Salem, he was also fascinated with what at that point was called natural philosophy. Now we call it science. He studied the weather, he studied botany, geology, astronomy, and medicine. And that wasn't such a weird thing because at that time, there was a shortage of doctors of any kind. And where the doctor wasn't, often it fell to the minister to minister to the bodies as well as to the souls of the people in his congregation. So it, it was kind of a natural outgrowth. Now, Mather had all his life, he had a stuttering problem. Just as he got out of college and was about to be ordained as a minister and start that life, he had basically a nervous breakdown, and he started stuttering uncontrollably, and he believed for a long time that he would never be a minister because he couldn't preach. Well, he actually managed to, really by force of creativity and will, he cured himself of stuttering, or at least he, he got it under control. It would come back to trouble him from time to time. I think what he did, actually, was, and you can sense this from his writing, that he created sort of a sing-song cadence, and that helped him uh, move past the stuttering, as is often the case with people who stutter. If they sing, they don't have that problem. But anyway, because he had almost had to give up ministry, he thought he'd have to go to second greatest love, which was medicine. So for a while, he actually thought about becoming a doctor. He ended up becoming a minister, as we all know. He became the most famous minister. He was, I call him the golden boy of American Puritanism. In his 20s, he was doing amazing things. Everybody thought that he was going to have 
the legacy that he believed he was going to have. He believed God sent him to earth to lead the people, to save the people, and to be their inspiration. And it looked like he was going to get that reputation. And then what happened was Salem, you know, and we could talk about Salem for an hour, but the bottom line on Salem was that Mather certainly does deserve some of the blame for Salem because he was sort of the expert witness that the judges used to confirm some of their worst instincts about witchcraft. And uh, he had an opportunity several times to renounce what they were doing, and he didn't do it. And why he didn't is very complicated. I think it has a lot to do with personal ambition, personally, because, you know, he loved having the ear of the most powerful men in Massachusetts. And really, it was a failure of character, I think, when he had an opportunity to walk away, or not to walk away, but to say, this has gone too far. You guys need to stop this. And in fact, his own father, Increase Mather, said that, and a number of other ministers said that. Cotton Mather did not say it. And so the blowback started a few years after Salem. And by 1710 or so, it took a long time for Massachusetts to come to grips with Salem. For a while, nobody said anything about it. And then gradually, people started talking about it. And some of the people apologized, like Samuel Seawall, who was one of the judges, a good friend of Mather and a character in my book. He actually got up in front of his congregation and apologized. Several of the girls who had been involved in the accusations apologized. A lot of the older players died. And all of a sudden, here's Mather, the only person who hasn't apologized. And 10 years after the fact, he's starting to lose his influence. He no longer has sort of a stranglehold on the Boston religious community, which is getting more diverse. He's locked out of politics. He always liked to have the ear of the governor. He doesn't have that anymore. He was passed over for the presidency of Harvard, which was another great sort of bastion of power in, in Massachusetts. And he was scrambling for some way to fulfill his destiny. And in 1710, he came up with, well, he wrote a book called Bonifacius, an essay upon the good, a short book. And what he did basically in that book was he redefined what it meant to be a leader in the community. Now, he, he redefined it to meet his own, <laughs> sort of his own strengths because he knew that he was never going to be the guy he had hoped to be in terms of being idolized and loved by the community. So he redefined what it meant to help the community. And it all came down to this idea of doing good, practical piety, they called it. So that meant you could serve God not only by being a minister or by being a politician, but by being a doctor and in a lot of other ways. And just by educating and informing and expanding the knowledge of your community. And sort of with that in mind, he set about becoming that guy in terms of science and medicine. And he began researching, writing, and sending letters to the Royal Society in London, which was the preeminent scientific organization in the world at that time, and hoped that he would, first of all, be published in their magazine or their journal, actually, called the Philosophical Transactions, which would be a good thing. And then he thought they would make him a member eventually. And he thought, if I can be part of the Royal Society, this great scientific organization, it will once and for all turn the corner from the superstitious guy of Salem. You know, it will redeem me. Indeed, by 1713, he did get word that he was going to be part of the Royal Society. At about the same time, unfortunately, he had a very tragic personal life. In 1713, uh, a measles epidemic came to Boston. And measles was very lethal in that time. It killed his second wife. His first wife had already died. And it killed three of his children. And he was devastated. But it recommitted him to this idea of researching medicine and understanding it and helping people as best he could. So he wrote a pamphlet about how to manage measles. And then he also started a big book, sort of an encyclopedia, about all the latest treatments in medicine. And then fast forward to 1716, he finally sees his first scientific article that he published in the Philosophical Transactions that arrives in Boston. And lo and behold, right after his article, there's another one. And this other one talks about this procedure that was being used in Turkey, very exotic, and it was said to prevent people from dying of smallpox. And that really caught his attention. And the reason it caught his attention, even more than the fact that he was a curious man and wanted to know everything he could, was that Cotton Mather had a slave named Onesimus. A lot of people owned slaves in Boston at that point, but very few there or anywhere else ever bothered to talk to the slaves and to get to understand who they were and what they were about. 
Cotton Mather, for all his flaws, had a, a very paternal relationship with the slaves in, that were uh, that were owned by his family. And he one day asked Onesimus, why do you have that strange scar on your shoulder? And Onesimus told him about a, a procedure that ended up being inoculation, which had been practiced in Africa for at least decades, perhaps even more. But it was completely unknown to Western medicine. So Mather knew that from Onesimus. He saw this article about a similar, almost identical procedure being published in the Philosophical Transactions, and he made a note to himself that the next time smallpox came to Boston, he was going to go to the doctors and urge them to experiment, and that's what he did. So it got to be about May of 1721, smallpox was sort of raging out of control, and he decided to write a letter, and he sent the letter to all the physicians in town. And all the physicians in town, except one, immediately dismissed it. And the one doctor who did not dismiss it was Abdiel Boylston. And he decides he's going to run what we would call today a clinical trial. And he chooses three people. And one of them is his six-year-old son. And you just talked about measles, how deadly those were at the time. Again, another vaccination that we take for granted that the entire method here really gets its start in the fever of 1721. That's what we're reading about as we read your book. He starts with his son, and he has very practical reasons. The thing that they're doing here are really life and death. And I think for a modern reader, it's a little bit hard to relate to it because you say, my gosh, why why would you do that to your son? Or why wouldn't you run away? I mean, he doesn't leave. He actually contracts smallpox at one point, doesn't he? To Because he's hoping he can recover in time to right. be able to help people. Right. Can you imagine? It's just such a selfless thing. I think the closest we get today to experiencing this fear is all the movies that we have. There's a virus of this kind. There's the great show, The Lost Ship. Well, I really like it anyway. Enjoy that. There's yeah. all the zombie things are usually called by an out of control virus. Right. And by the way, you know, having a science background myself, I have to say the vaccines don't cure you. They just prevent you from getting it. I right. know it's in almost every movie where they magically invent a cure for viruses. But hate to tell you, there's never <laughs> been a virus cured yet, folks. So <laughs> if you weren't scared before of smallpox, you will be now. Yeah. There's, right. Once you get it, you either overcome it, as is the case here with smallpox or or you end up in the ground. So that's definitely worth keeping in mind here as you're reading the book. Thank God that we do have this ability to sort of at least compete against it. And uh, I think everybody certainly knows about vaccinating their pets. So you definitely want to think of it uh, for yourself. These are things we don't even think that might be in the water, might be carried by a mosquito. And this is incredible that it takes place at this real nexus of years. I mean, when I picked up this book, I thought, well, 1721, we tend to focus on much sexier years, I guess, 1860s with the Civil War, Mm -hmm. or we focus on, I don't know, maybe 1960. There's a great huge election there. There's 1824. There's another big American election there. There's years, of course, uh, in Europe that are huge years. There's World War II. There's years in China where you have the invention of gunpowder. You have the Huns roaming across Asia, all these great times in history. But 1721, this is a really key nexus. And you write in the book a quote that I want to ask you to comment on. You write, quote, the Boston inoculation experiment was a victory for reason over both superstition and unquestioning obeisance to accepted scientific notions, unquote. Inoculation remains what you call a wedge issue throughout the 1700s, all the way up through the American Revolution. But it saves many of the founders, like John Adams, who we talked about earlier, who are far-sighted enough to go ahead and risk it all, literally risk their lives here on this unproven idea of getting inoculated. And this is not a little injection. I mean, you still are going to come down with smallpox. Right, so right. this is not anything anything like a sterile needle. This is nothing like that. This is It is very much risky. So when I looked at that, and as I said, having an animal science background, How do you look at today when we have these arguments or we have these discussions or these challenges? The enlightenment here, one of the great things that it gives us is, in fact, inoculation. So what do you hope your readers take away from reading The Fever of 1721 as far as 
what to me I would say is critical thinking because we have many of these same modern challenges that we need to meet today, not only about medicine. I, the smallpox is definitely a scary part. We have a lot of vaccines. We could use a lot more, but also from the Ben and James Franklin side about our liberty and a free press and how we want to be governed, especially in a presidential election year here in America. What do you hope people take away from the book? Well, I think, you know, you mentioned the Enlightenment, and and clearly what was going on in Boston in 1721 was deeply influenced by the European Enlightenment, not in some very specific ways, but also just by sort of the spirit of looking at things anew. But, you know, it's interesting. We talk about the Enlightenment nowadays as though it was a foregone conclusion that everyone woke up one day at the beginning of the 18th century, and all of a sudden they saw the world in a different light and the truth and rational thinking and everything was so obvious, when in fact, that's not what happened. There was an enormous resistance to rational critical thinking that in the course of the Enlightenment, John Locke, who helped launch the Enlightenment, said, truth scarce ever yet carried it by vote anywhere at its first appearance. New opinions are always suspected and usually opposed without any reason but because they are not already common. And I think if there's a a lesson to take away from the book, whether it's from the medical story about a a medical breakthrough or about the idea of, of freedom, liberty, and freedom of speech or whatever, it's this notion that it took and it still takes an enormous amount of courage to put aside long held, deeply ingrained beliefs and prejudices, you know, whether they're racial prejudices and cultural prejudices, as was the case with a lot of people who opposed inoculation because it was recommended by an African and by Turks who were considered less than full people by a lot of Westerners. Whether it's that or it's a religious prejudice or a scientific prejudice or political, I think that it takes a lot of courage to think beyond those things and to think critically. And, you know, it seems to me that we live at a time, in a time right now where it's become a virtue not to change your mind and not to look at things fresh and not to allow yourself to be challenged by opposing points of view. And that any willingness to do those things is kind of regarded as a weakness. I don't agree with that. I think it takes a strong person to dare to consider another different way, especially in the face of groupthink or the establishment or whatever, what have you. So in a sense, I guess the enlightenment's still going on, and at least we still need to challenge ourselves. We need to practice that kind of intellectual courage that we need if we're going to meet challenges in, in all of these different realms. So I guess I hope that people who read The Fever of 1721 will maybe get a little inspiration along those lines. Well, Stephen Koss, I want to thank you for joining me today. I want to thank James Campbell for encouraging you to write The Fever of 1721. I was going to ask you if you were having Sam Adams beer when you were drinking that night and he encouraged (laughs) you to write the book because that would have been very appropriate. But I'm going to imagine that. So I, I don't think I even want to know because it's so perfect. I'm just going to imagine it that way. But thank you so much for joining us today to bring to life these people like Ben Franklin, like Cotton Mather, people who suffered and fought these diseases and fought for a democracy so that in about 50 years time, we could give birth to the American Revolution and have so many of the freedoms of the press and of liberty, personal liberty that we enjoyed today. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Smallpox doesn't disappear after the events of 1721. 300 million people died of smallpox in the 20th century alone. Three times more than those killed in World War I, World War II, and the smaller conflicts combined. The United States had its final case of smallpox in 1947. The World Health Organization declared the planet Earth free of smallpox in 1979. It's the first time an epidemic disease has been eradicated completely. So good job, humanity. It all started, though, way back in 1721, with a disgraced reverend's quest for redemption and a risk-taking doctor's boldness. And the Franklin brothers, who gave the colonies their first taste of a free press. A taste that we haven't found satisfied yet. Again, the book is The Fever of 1721, the epidemic that revolutionized medicine and American politics. As always, you can find the link to purchase your copy of the book at our website, historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. We get a few pennies every time you make a purchase, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Once again, 
Thank you to Stephen Koss for joining me and for taking us back to a key year in history for politics, medicine, and the press. Oh, and I want to thank Matt Douglas of the Nightmare 365 podcast for suggesting that we do a show on Ben Franklin. We'll touch on it more in the future because there's obviously so much to talk about with Ben Franklin. In the meantime, check out Matt's scary things going on at 365. You can follow him on Twitter at mcdouglas82. As for Stephen, don't forget to follow him at cost one cost on Twitter and visit his website, stephencoss.com. And let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or at Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for all the social media plugs and all the talk about smallpox. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and I hope you'll pop in for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio. Thanks so much for listening. And happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.